So uh, last week we finished up a series. We're going to spend a couple weeks looking at about some irrational parts of our faith. And before we do that in your program every week, I tell you there's a place for you to take some notes. That's for your benefit, maybe to write something down to remember later or to share with somebody else. There's a study guide on the back of that for you to get into God's Word a little deeper on your own or with somebody else than we can in this time here. I tell you often to not take my word for everything. Don't take any pastor's word for it all. God wants you to wrestle with his word and who you are and who he is. And we just want to give you a tool to be able to do that. So today, um, we'll start with this. What do you think when somebody says the word irrational? What comes to mind? Or maybe it's not a what, it's a who, right? When you think of somebody who's irrational, somebody at the first service like pounding on her husband, that's irrational. Irrational kind of has a bad rap in our society because to be irrational flies in the face of what we were raised to be, especially in our churches. Um, we are, by the way, just so you understand what rational is, the, the kind of a phrase, or something that is irrational or someone that is irrational is something that, or somebody who's not being reasonable, who, who is not logical, that doesn't make sense. And I know for you guys, you're like, well, that just describes every woman that I have ever met. But listen, they are rational in their own ways. But we as a church, we have always wanted to try to be rational. In fact, in our denomination, in our tradition, it kind of became part of who we are. We are called Methodists, and we're called Methodists for a reason. We got that name about 250 years ago. Our founder was an amazing man by the name of John Wesley, and he and a group of friends, they took their faith so seriously that they were very methodical about every part of their faith life. And when I say faith life, what I mean is their life. They didn't believe that you had a faith life and then you had another life, that they were all combined, and they were very methodical about how they did life. Um, they uh, were very methodical about when they woke up in the morning and what they did after they woke up. In fact, John Wesley, the first thing he did when he woke up is he spent an hour in prayer and in the scriptures. They were very methodical about that thing. They were methodical about every minute of the day and how they spent it, how they served the neediest of people, how they visited those who were in prisons, how they, they read the Bible and they studied together, how they um, got together as groups of people. They called them societies um, and, and other church terms, we call them Sunday school classes or life groups or home groups, but they were very methodical about coming together, not just to learn about God and the scripture, but also to hold each other accountable. They were methodical about, about everything. In fact, when they first were called the Methodists, it was considered a slam. People were making fun of them because they were so methodical, but John Wesley didn't seem to mind because it did exactly what he was hoping it would do, which is to take a faith away from just, uh, you know, I believe in Jesus and I've got my golden ticket, to a faith that says, you know, if I believe in Jesus and I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, then I need to do whatever I can to help heaven come here. And so that takes practices in life to do it. So he was very methodical about how we lived in this world. He created a movement um, that was very thought out, that was very deep in its faith, that was very intellectual, it, that stirred people's hearts and minds. It got them to not just change their communities, but the whole world. It was very logical, and it was very rational. And I think that if John Wesley were here, he would probably get a kick out of the fact that we're going to talk for the next couple weeks about being irrational. And I think he would approve. Um, because the principles we're going to talk about from just in general, from the American point of view, what we're going to talk about is illogical, it's irrational, maybe supernatural. And today, we're going to talk about the irrational side of being generous in this world. Now, i just tell you, I've had conversations with many people over the last decade or so of being a pastor. And one of the, the common things that I hear about you, about our church, is this. They say, St. Paul's, it, it, it's one of the most generous churches in the area. They were always giving to something or people are involved in something. Just so you know, on a financial level, we support different ministries throughout Carl Junction and Joplin, uh, things like Water Gardens, um, Cross Lines, Bright Futures uh, with Cecil Floyd in Joplin, as well as the Intermediate Building right over here across our parking lot, Helping Hands, we help them out. Um, we are generous with people. Um, but here's the thing is often if we don't talk about something, it just kind of seeps. And that's why I want to talk about this today. Because not because you're not doing it, but because you are. And often whenever you're just kind of doing something, it becomes part of who you are, it's easy to kind of drift away from it. 
and what I've said in the first service with many people who go to church on Sundays, you leave and you're like, well, I've heard pastor talk about forgiveness and grace and all these different things before. Why do I need to hear that again? It's because we forget, right? We, it slowly drifts. And so we want to remind ourselves. Now, I heard this a couple weeks ago, and maybe you've said this, or maybe you've heard it as well, that most Americans, they don't feel like they're rich, but yet we are. And that most Americans think that we're generous, but we're not. Now, I'm going to unpack this real quick. Most of us don't really feel uh, rich. When I'm talking about rich, I'm talking about financially rich. And there's a reason for that. Do you know what that reason is? It's because there's always somebody richer, Right? There's always somebody on your street that's got the nicer lawn or the bigger house or the newer car. We don't ever really feel rich because there's always somebody richer. We compare ourselves. And when we start to compare ourselves, we start to feel like we don't have much. But when we compare ourselves to the world, and we did this a few months ago when we talked about some income things, what we start to realize is that we are extremely blessed financially in this culture, in America, Listen, if you have a car, if you drove here today, you are wealthy to the tune of the top 6 to 9% globally. You are rich. But we take these things for granted. For example, I'll just tell you some things we take for granted. Chances are most of you experienced this in the last week or two. You got in your car or somebody else's car. You drove down the road. And since you live in Carl Junction, you probably bypassed um, Randy's and... Uh, the bamboo and others because you wanted to go to the big city, you know, to eat somewhere, and you drove past 10 or 12 different restaurants to find the restaurant that you liked the most. And and then you got there, and you parked your car, and you went in, and maybe it was inconvenient because you had to wait five or 10 minutes, but you were able to be seated. You were able to open up a menu and order something, and wouldn't you know it, you ordered a meal that somebody else cooked for you, and they brought it to you, put it on your table. You ate it. And then somebody magically came and took your dishes away. Something magically washed them all for you. You didn't have to deal with it. And because you go to church when you were there, you tipped your wait, your wait staff exceedingly well, didn't you? Yes. If you're not, listen, quit being a cheapskate, all right? Tip really well. That's how they make their living. Um, but that's what happened. And then here's what happened after you got done is you got back in your car. And you probably drove home or somewhere else. But by the time you got home, if you drove to a house like mine, you reached up on your sun visor and you pressed a button and a door magically opened and you drove into it. And it's called a garage. But think about it. Your car has its own house. Yeah, if you closed the door and you went inside and there was temperature control and you felt fairly comfortable, although then it got really cold the last few days and so you fought with the thermostat. But at any rate, you get it. We're rich. Then here's the thing, at some point you go to the bathroom, and yes, I'm going to talk about the bathroom because it's reality. When, here's, when you go to the bathroom and you do whatever it is you do, um, and you push the lever or push the button, what happens? Exactly, Pat said it, your stuff, I'm going to say stuff, but you know what I'm talking about, goes away. I mean, that, how blessed are you? Listen, if you don't stop every now and then and thank God that when you push a button, your stuff goes away, I mean, you're missing out because there are people all over this world that don't even have a button to push. But even if they did, they push it, and guess what? Their stuff still sits there in a hole. No, not you. You push a button, and your stuff, it goes away. I mean, how blessed, how rich are we? And then you go to sleep in an actual bed, and maybe it's not the sleep number bed or, you know, that really nice bed, but it's your own. And you're able to sleep, and you get up the next day, and you walk into your closet, and if you're like me, you go, and and uh, now, now, granted, my wife has most of our closet, but I have a good, decent part of it, and I've got like a two-story part on mine, and I go in, and I file through the clothes that are from one wall to the next, and you know what I say? I got nothing to wear. <laughs> yes, that's a guy problem. It's just not a lady problem. If I have nothing to wear. I mean, how, how, how rich are we? How blessed are we? Here's the other thing. Most Americans say, um, if you're asked, are you generous? You say, yeah, I'm pretty generous. But here's the reality is that we're not. The average American gives away about 2.8% of their income to a charity or church or something out there of what they make. And, And if you're really blessed and you make a lot of money, the amount that you give away by percentage actually goes down. That's what we've learned with statistics. And and actually, oh, excuse me, did you hear that? Wow. 
very rich. Um, it goes down to the tune of, you know, like 2.8% of is given away before 100,000. When you start making 100,000 or more, it starts going down to 2.6 and below. We say we're generous, but the statistics say we're not. Fewer and fewer Americans now actually give to some sort of charity out there. And, and it's I'm starting to see that that's even become more because what's happened in the last 12 months in America is we've had a tax bill that's come that's been great. It, it has uh, lowered taxes for many people, but what it's also done is it's made it to where you can no longer write off charitable contributions to a certain point because anybody know taxes? I can sit here and do a sermon on it. I love doing taxes. But at any rate, you don't get as much of a bump from it. And so what we're noticing is charities aren't getting as much money because people tend to give just for the purpose of taxes. And I hope Christians aren't doing that. I hope you give because God has, has put that on your heart. But listen, as Jesus followers, that's not what we should do. As Jesus followers, we should do something different and lead the way with intentional irrational generosity because we truly believe that it's more it's more of a blessing to give than it is to receive and why do we believe that it's because jesus taught us that and jesus modeled it so the challenge is this i've never met anybody that says you know what i don't want to give more almost everybody i've met when we talk about the idea of giving to something or somebody they always say i'd love to give more but i can't can't and there's always reasons why we can't it's not that I don't want to it's just that I can't and I think that comes from a mindset that we have and we just need to name it I'm going to explain it and it's called a scarcity mindset and I understand this mindset because this is what I was raised on and this is what I practiced most of my life in my family growing up my parents didn't talk much about money but there was this subtle underlying word and worry that there was never really enough to make the ends meet or there was just barely enough it's a scarcity mindset and it's a cycle and it starts like this um it look you know you receive an income and as christians we believe that god has supplied that for us but in a scarcity mindset whenever we receive from god what happens is we consume because that's part of our culture right we consume and, and we buy things in other words we feel like whatever we have is there for us and so we buy and we consume, and at the end of the month or the end of the paycheck, we're all of a sudden going, oh, no, I'm about to run out. I don't have enough. And whenever there's fear around that, then we start to freak out. Uncertainty brings fear. And then all of a sudden, their paycheck shows up. We feel better. We consume. All of a sudden, oh, I don't know if I have enough. We start to worry. and We start to fear. And it's this cycle that happens over and over and over. And I got a feeling that I've just described many of you in here. And, and you can hear... Um, why, when I talk about this with others, that we would say things like, you know what, I wish I could do more, but I just can't. I never can seem to get ahead. No matter what I do, there's just never enough. And that is the cycle of scarcity, the scarcity mindset. And what I want to teach you today is maybe a different sort of mindset. I want to show you that as Jesus followers, we should have a different mindset. Because of what God did through Jesus, we should be able to do something first differently and it creates a whole different cycle in us i want to explain it by going through a passage by the apostle paul the man we named our church after he was one of the very first men to go out and start churches all over the place um, that weren't jewish and this is what he wrote to one of his churches he tells them he tells us to remember this that a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop and you must decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all that you need. And by the way, this is where the scarcity mindset starts to break down because we start talking about needs and not wants. Because God will provide all that you need. And then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer, and then he provides the bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And I want to just first put out a warning to you here because you may have seen this online or on TV or heard other pastors preach this, this idea that, you know what, if you give to God, then God's going to, because of this, exponentially 
financially bless you. That is a lie. That is. That's a consumer. That's an American consumerism mindset. What we start to understand really is when you start to change the way you give in life, yes, God blesses you, but in a very different way, which is what we're going to start to understand. Paul's teaching is about supply. And it's not rational. It's irrational. It's not natural. It's supernatural. And this is what I mean. So imagine the first graphic that we had up there, that God supplies. But if we do something different rather than consume first, if we do the irrational thing and we give to someone, to something first, this is what we do as Christians. If we give cheerfully and joyfully and not under pressure, then we really start to believe that it's a massive blessing to be able to gener be generous to others. We start to believe that. And as Jesus followers, we give to God first because... God gave to us the most uh, famous passage in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And by the way, it doesn't say that God so loved the Methodists that he gave his only son. He, he loved the whole world, and so he gave. And so that's why we give. When we give, what does God do? When you read that passage, Paul paints this picture that God starts to multiply it. Paul talked about how you put one seed in the ground and you get a small harvest. But if you put a bunch of seeds in there, you get a, a bigger harvest. God multiplies what we give. And then when that happens, we don't have fear. And then what happens? Our faith, it starts to grow. We start to trust God a little bit more. And then whenever we do that, we're able to give more. And then God multiplies more and our faith grows. That's what Paul is describing here. Now listen, if you are like I do from time to time, get stuck in that cycle of scarcity, the way to break from it is to intentionally do something different. You know, if you start that one cycle with consuming to, to really break from it, you got to start the other cycle by giving to something. And in church, we talk about it often. It's called the tithe. And, and people always worry when the pastor starts talking about the tithe. And listen, I, I love to talk about the tithe, not because I'm a, a numbers guy and a money guy, but I am. But, but I talk about it. Why? Because, to be honest with you, I open this up often, more often than my Bible. And, and I know something about you. You worry more about the contents of this or your bank account than other things in life. This is a spiritual thing. And so we talk about it. I mean, the tithe, in the biblical sense, comes from the Jewish word. It's actually rooted in a, a Hebrew word, maser, which means one-tenth. It's a fraction. 10%, and it was designed as this, this one-tenth of everything that we get, we give back to God in some way. It's returning to him. It's God saying, God, yes, thank you for giving to me. I'm going to return 10% back to you. And then God multiplies it, and, and, and our faith starts to change, and the world starts to change. And suddenly what happens when you start to live that way is you start to break the cycle of scarcity and the mentality of that. Well, let's unpack this because I, I just educate you real quick on the tithe. Because sometimes people say, what does the tithe actually do? Um, and, and I'm going to tell you that, no, it doesn't go to the pastor's hot tub fund. But I'm going to start one if anybody wants to help me out here. No, it does other things. So somebody got that. Yeah. Uh, here's one thing that happens when people tithe or they, they give generously is uh, it teaches you to put God first in your life. That's exactly how it's translated in the Living Bible. It says this, that the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your life. And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, that's scary. Ben, <laughs> uh, things are tight. I don't want to do this. And asking me to tithe? Really, Ben? Asking me to tithe that means I'm going to have to rearrange my whole life around God. Is that what you're asking me? Yes. Yeah, I am. To do that would, would, would be crazy. It would be crazy faith. And yes, it would be. But that's exactly what I'm telling you. Why? Because it takes faith to give first. It doesn't take faith to give last. It takes faith to tithe and to give to God first. Rather than waiting to see if there's anything left over, and then maybe I'll do it. It takes faith. When you tithe, your faith grows. 
It's a very tangible way of saying, God, because of what you did for me, this is my honor to give back to you. I have rearranged and reprioritized my financial life for you, and I put you first. That's what tithing teaches us, is to put God first. And then it starts to build our faith. That's the second thing it does. You start to see the faithfulness of God, not just in yourself, but in the world. I'm going to go back to the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. God says this to the prophet. He tells us, to bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. And if you do, I will open the windows of heaven for you, and I will pour out the blessing. So great, you won't even have enough room to take it all in. Try it, he says. Put me to the test. This is, by the way, the only passage in your whole Bible that is God saying, test me on this. It's like him saying, I double dog dare you to try it and see what happens. God is saying, see if my economy is not different than this world's. See if, if all of a sudden you can break this consume and lack and fear cycle to be something completely different. God is saying this, give me your first and your best. I will bless the rest. It's like a promise from him. He says, I promise you, you can live on 90% that God blesses so much better than you can live on 100% that you just kept for yourself. That's what he's saying. And listen, it is not rational. It's a little bit crazy. But you got to make a decision to do that. And, and maybe you're here thinking, man, a tithe sounds great. Yes, you are inspirational, but I just can't do it now. And if that's you, I want to kind of give you a metaphor here because you might also be like me. Imagine going to the gym. And, of course, for me, I have to imagine it. Why? Because I don't really do it. But if you go to the gym and there's a personal trainer who says, Ben, drop and give me 50 push-ups. If I said that to you, how many of you could do it? <laughs> You'd be like a handful. But most of us would be like, oh, no, I can't do 50. But drop and give me what you can, and you do six. And then you go home and you cry because you hurt. And then the next day you go in and you do some more. And about two weeks later, all of a sudden, you notice you're up to 20. And three weeks later, you're up to 30. And about six weeks later, you're doing 50. And then what you catch yourself doing to your trainer is this. Is that all you got? 50 ain't nothing. That's, that's how it starts, to be generous. That's what happens with generosity. You start with something small, and it grows, and it grows. You start, and then you start to tithe, and you see God's provision, and you see the change in your life. And then you, all of a sudden, you want to start helping people all over the place in different ways. And suddenly, what you realize is you're starting to rearrange your whole life because you've recognized that what God has given you is not actually all for you, but it's for others. And by the way, it is not the American way. It is irrational, but it's powerful, and it's freeing, and it's nothing like the people around you are living today, and I know it's true. Listen, as a church, I still believe we are one of the most generous. Back in 2008, when the housing market plummeted and we went through the Great Recession, is what we've called it in America, um, we as a church, we made a conscious decision. We actually talked about this, that, you know what, our inclination would be to say, oh, no, we got to be careful because people's incomes are going down. They're not going to give. We need to hold on to what we have just in case. But we decided, no, we're going to meet our obligations and we're going to give. Um, we, during that time, were able to rebuild after the tornado hit, even though our building was destroyed, help other families. We were able to raise $250,000 at that time to build 50 new homes in Nicaragua. And it would have been so much easier and justified to say we can't. But it was irrational to do it. That's why when I tell you as a church, and I mean it, I believe, because we have done it, that we will continue to lead the way in this area in irrational generosity. I believe it because I've seen it. Now, the tithe, it teaches us to put God first. It, it builds our faith. And then I'm going to just tell you without apology right now that the tithe does this as well. It provides for the work of God's church wherever God's church is located. When you return a 10% to God's church, work gets done. Back to Matthew three, or Malachi 3, it said this, Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Now let me ask you, for some of you might be able to answer this, how many would you say that your life is somehow different? because of this church what happens 
What happens when you give to a church like this? I've got to tell you, 20 years ago when I walked into a church wanting nothing to do with it, I happen. God's work happens. Your life is impacted. That's just what we do as a church. I want to tell you about a few of them. Two years ago as a church, we launched a new ministry called Celebrate Recovery. I call it CR because I like short little initials rather than all of the syllables. I'm just efficient that way. But CR over the last two years has grown. It has reached over 100, actually 111 different individual adults. Every Monday night, there's on average 59 adults there with some of their kids. And people come seeking to, for a way to overcome a hurt or a habit or a hang up. They come to share their grief and their brokenness, to learn about relationships, to overcome depression and addiction. While the adults are there in their small groups, their kids are learning how to address the issues that they face in life. And Celebrate Recovery has expanded over the last two years in one area in particular, and in part because of Pastor Rick, who's not here. And I know I always make fun of him, right? I want to brag on him. You see, you see Rick is a, a Navy veteran. And, and he has a heart for the veterans in this area. When he started helping with CR, he saw that, man, there was such a need for a group, for a place for veterans to come together and overcome their hurts and habits and hang-ups. And so he connected with an area here, that a group that helps veterans, and they started taking them to CR. And that is one of the largest growing groups at CR. In fact, you probably see some of them here worshiping. I want you to hear the story from one of them. His name is uh, Stephen Thomas. Check this out. Went in 1987. I got out uh, January of 1991. I was in the United States Navy. I'm proud that I served my country. Um, it was interesting. My addiction started prior to me going to the military, but I didn't realize that um, I was an addict then, you know, until I actually came back. But as a veteran, the VA has been good to me, you know, because I probably wouldn't be here today. After 35 years, I went to prison in the midst of that, uh, got through that. So I made a decision to, to live today. And through Celebrate Recovery, I had that, I, I've been having that opportunity you know, through St. Paul Church having to celebrate recovery. I always had a, a spiritual foundation. It was just the fact that I didn't surrender. I'm clean and soul, got six months clean. Spiritual, got my spiritual foundation back with the Lord. I do a lot of service work. I do a lot of giving back. Um, I'm loving myself again. I helped Pastor Rick out over do a lot of volunteering over at St. Paul and Call Junction. Things that I took, I didn't do, because I didn't do a lot for my kids, you know. So I try to do a lot of things for kids today because my children only seen me in my addiction. But the kids today, they don't have to see that. And, um, and I'm very proud of that as well. My family has been restored to me. They trusted me again. Uh, depending on me again, uh, like talking to me again. <laughs> so it's been good. You know, God been good to me. That's who I give all praise and credit to. It ain't nothing I did. It's all what the goodness of what the Lord has did for me. Windows of heaven been open. You know, and I'm, and I'm grateful for that today. I love how he said, um, I love myself today. How many of you can say that? You know, CR has not just changed Stephen's life, but many people. And one of the things that Rick noticed is for many of them, they have a hard time getting there. So he started coming and get one of the church vans and would go and pick people up. And then wouldn't you know it, that that one van isn't enough. And so they're trying to find other people to drive. I got to tell you, we're going to need more people to drive vans. Why do we do it? Because God gave to us. That's what we do. As a church, we've also trained a dozen different people 
to uh, be called uh, congregational care ministers so that if, if you're going through a difficult time or an illness or you're homebound relational struggles, there is somebody available to be able to, to walk through life with you and to comfort you and, and to give you encouragement and to pray so that nobody gets left out. That's what we do. Over the last couple months, with the hurricanes that hit, we as a church have been able to send $8,500 to help people restart whenever they lost everything. Why? Because that's what we do. In the last year as a church, we've helped 58 different families right here within our church um, with utilities and medication and food and gas and, and just their basic needs. And that's not counting what we help with all the other organizations that we're involved in. And we're gearing up. You're going to hear about it all the way through Christmas around uh, give a gift and change a life, helping people with Thanksgiving and Christmas. That's what we do. This is why we do it, though. It's because God gave to us. Because of what he did, that's what we do. And i got to tell you, I have no problem talking to you about this. Many pastors are afraid to talk about this topic, but I don't have a problem with it because I've seen it and I'm the product of it which is why about 10 years ago I made the change in myself to return the tithe. And because of that, Jesus has done something in me. And I believe he's honored that in me and that it's become an act of worship whenever I do it. Because of what God did, I want to lead the way and be generous. I want our church to lead the way and be generous. So I'll leave you with a question. That's this. As a church, I've said it a handful of times, that's what we do, right? So let me ask you, do you want to be a part of the we? Is that the life that you want to have? If that's what we do, is that what you want to do? And if so, maybe it means you got to start breaking a cycle today of scarcity and start to trust for a different cycle of abundance. Consuming, lacking, being afraid. Consuming, lacking, being afraid. That is no way to live. And if you want to start something different, it starts with a decision. And listen, it's a decision that doesn't make sense, and it's not natural, it's supernatural, it's irrational. We give, God multiplies, our faith grows, something changes in us and changes in the world, and we want to give more. This isn't just what we do, it's who we are. Why, again? Because it's what God did. We invite you to be a part of that. So next week, i just tell you, is something we call Commitment Sunday. And you've probably seen a card in your program, and maybe even one got mailed to you. If, if you've been a member of the church for a long time, you've probably heard about this or gone through St. Paul's, Discover St. Paul's or visit one of the pastors. We've talked about it. That it's, a, it's a tool for you. We want you to be able to use it, to pray about it, to physically write something down, to say, God, this is what I want to be able to do. And maybe, God, right now, all I can do is six push-ups. So I'm going to tell you I'm going to do six, and then maybe next year it's more. Listen, it, it's just a way for us to help remind you of being generous. It's what I do. And so we do, and I pray that you're able to do it as well. So let's take a moment, let's close, let's pray together and consider this uh, generous life. God, find us. God, change us. God, take away our fear. God, the reality is many of us right now, even as we're talking about this, are uncomfortable, not because we don't want to be generous, but because we can't. Because we have lived a life in such a way that it's impossible to be so. We have bought in to the American dream in such a way that we consume and we lack and we fear. God, break that cycle. Create a new heart in us. Be generous people, not just financially, but with our time with our talents. Forgive us when we have used all the resources you've given us just for ourselves and never thought of another person. Come, Holy Spirit, change us. Make us a generous people. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.